This webinar style is real-time calorimetry with RTCAL, an innovative process analytical technology, and is very much about showing that calorimetry, a technique sometimes considered as an odd one, has recently been completely rejuvenated and can now be considered as a real-time online monitoring technology. I suggest to begin with a very brief introduction to why and how calorimetry is used today in the development of chemical processes in the pharma and chemical industries. We then take a look at how real-time calorimetry dubbed RT Carl works. Finally, we'll go together over a few examples outlining the main benefits of real-time calorimetry. There are mostly four areas today where calorimetry is applied in chemical reaction development. One is process safety, where people look at process parameters like heat of reaction, heat capacity, delta T adiabatic, process maximum temperature. The second area is kinetics. Combination of calorimetry with other techniques like React IR is very common to obtain reaction information like heat of reaction, but also activation energy and reaction order. Still, a further one is crystallization. Crystallization studies can greatly benefit from the use of calorimetry. For instance, to determine time and temperature when crystallization occurs, as well as heat of reaction and heat of distribution. The list would also be incomplete without mentioning the application of calorimetry in the area of mixing, heat transfer, as well as understanding of reaction dynamics, and I put this under the more general term of process development. This slide lists most of the available calorimetry technologies on commercial or scientific devices today. The method that has over the years proven the most robust and is predominant today on the market is undoubtedly heat flow. Heat flow is available on the famous RC1 as well as on other devices from other companies. Heat flow is based on the simultaneous measurement of the reaction temperature TR and jacket temperature TG. More about this later in my talk. Another one is power compensation, which principally is based on the use of a heater inside the reaction mixture. There is also heat balance, a well-established method based on the temperature difference between jacket inlet and outlet. A method that, ha that appeared on the market a couple of years ago is coflux or constant flux. Temperature control in this case is provided by a series of coolant coils that can be opened or closed on demand. RT Carl is a new method base, uh, made available on th to the market last year and provided by Metal Toledo on the RC1 as a compl complementary method to the existing heat flow technology. Now let's see a little bit more in detail how RT Carl works. The RT Carl technology is based on the use of sensors attached to the reactor wall. We'll see where exactly later. There is a sensor wrapped horizontally at the bottom and another one vertical in the back. The horizontal one at the bottom detects the heat coming in and out of the vessel. The vertical sensor in the back helps determine automatically the heat exchange area between the reaction mixture and the vessel wall. There is a direct relationship between the reaction enthalpy and on one hand the heat detected by the lower band and on the other hand the heat exchange area between the reaction mixture and the vessel wall. This is a large picture of the article vessel, where you see the two types of sensors at the bottom and in the back. Where are the sensors really located? If you look closer, you will see the reaction mixture here on the left and the inside reactor wall. The sensors are located right there on the outside of the vessel inner wall. The sensors are in contact with the jacket fluid. The vessel is also equipped with a layer of vacuum to provide better efficiency at very low temperature. These sensors are glued in a polymer matrix and emit a voltage signal when submitted to temperature variations caused by a thermal event in the vessel. The voltage signal is sent to an electronic box which translates the information into heat data. Now let's go back to the two methods available on the RC1, namely heat flow and RT call, and let's make a comparison. For heat flow, the heat coming out of the reaction mixture is an expression of the temperature difference between the reaction and the jacket 
as well as the heat exchange area and the heat transfer coefficient characterizing the system. This technique requires to know what UA is, which makes calibration steps necessary, typically before and after the reaction event. Also, the heat exchange area, A, has to be visually determined regularly during the reaction. So you really have to wait until the final calibration is done before you can get quantitative data about your reaction parameters. Despite the great advantages of heat flow, it's not a process analytical technology because you cannot really walk away from the system. It requires human presence. On the other hand, RT-CAL does not require any calibration, so no need to wait until a final calibration to get all the data. Also, thanks to the vertical sensor, the heat exchange area is automatically determined without any operator input, so the whole process can be fully automated and left unattended. Now I'd like to illustrate what I just said using a few examples. This is the kind of setup we used. This is an RC1 outfitted with an article vessel. You can see the sensors right there. We also use a React IR instrument called React IR IC10 for online FTIR data acquisition. The first example describes the polymerization of styrene using toluene as a solvent and AIBN as an activator. Here are the reaction conditions. There is an initial charge of styrene and toluene. The temperature is raised to 85 degrees, AIBN is added. Then the mixture is held at constant temperature for 6 hours. The reaction mixture is next cooled down to 25 degrees and hydroquinone is added to quench the reaction. From a process characterization standpoint, we want to know the reaction time, the reaction enthalpy and the maximum heat output. It's a polymerization reaction, the reaction mixture becomes fairly viscous and as such the heat transfer coefficient gets lower. In other words, the reaction mixture tends to be less of a good heat conductor at the end than it is in the beginning. The benefits of rt -Cal that I'm going to emphasize on are the real-time aspect as well as the absence of any calibration. Also the fact that the heat exchange area is automatically determined without the need of any operator input. Also, rt -Cal is insensitive to viscosity change because the heat transfer coefficient, which changes in this reaction, is not involved in the calculation in this case. This is a graph representing the heat of reaction here in blue, where you can spot the two heat flow calibrations as well as the polymerization event. You can see here the nice exotherm. You can also see the heat transfer coefficient values for each one of the two calibrations. Despite all the advantages of heat flow calorimetry over most of the other methods available on the market, the user has to deal with the following. 1. The field volume in the reactor has to be recorded to account for the variation of heat exchange area during the course of the reaction. These changes can be due to temperature changes, strain speed changes, and additions to the vessel. Also, it is important to estimate how UA changes between the two calibration points. Should we do a linear interpolation like shown here by the pale blue curve? Or, if I go to the next slide, should I uh, do the interpolation um, based on proportional to torque measurement as an expert user would know and do? The torque value is increasing and presumably proportionally to reaction conversion, as this is a polymerization reaction. Torque is certainly what makes most sense, <coughs> and an expert user would certainly not miss this, but as you can see here, the choice made regarding interpolation has a major impact on what the calculated value for reaction enthalpy is. There is like a 30% difference between the two values. The shape as well is going to be impacted and with this the kinetic profile for people who use the heat profile for kinetic modeling. 
So in brief, when running a heat flow calorimetry and a polymerization reaction, there is some level of evaluation and understanding of calorimetry concepts that are necessary in order to obtain reliable results. Now, the same experiment run using RTCAL as a calorimetry method looks sli slightly different. No need for calibration before and after. The field volume or virtual volume is determined automatically no need for operator input. You can see here the nice heat of reaction profile. The results obtained using RT call are very close to the ones obtained using heat flow but without the level of evaluation and expertise that heat flow requires. In other words, RT call is a transparent effortless calorimetry technique. Beside polymerization reactions, other application or uses could be precipitation or crystallization, or any example where the viscosity or thickness of the reaction mixture changes over time. In these examples, RT Carl could be also uh, extremely useful. I'd like to move to the second example now. The question that RT Carl answers can be very simply laid out the following way. You have an exothermic reaction run in a semi-batch mode where the reagent is added over time. The plant vessel has a limited cooling capacity, like any plant vessel, and you need to determine the optimal dosing rate so the process is run fast, but not to the point where the reaction temperature may get out of control. How can you use RTCAL to do the job in the most effective way? We did a proof concept using our own lab and a basic chemical reaction, the hydrolysis of acetic anhydride. Water and sulfuric acid are first charged to the reactor. The reaction temperature is raised to 50 degrees and acetic anhydride is added to the vessel with the condition that the heat output from the reaction must reach 5 Watt. Then, after a certain amount of reagent has been added, the condition is changed from 5 Watt to 10 Watt. So we want to know here what the dosing time is for a specified amount of acetic anhydride and also we want to know what the heat of reaction is. Setup in the article software is straightforward. The first step is a condition on the end heat output to be reached in 4 minutes. The second step is an end condition of a specified amount of acetic anhydride added to the reactor using a pump and a balance involved in a PID control loop. Now is the experiment evaluation window which shows heat output in red on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. The blue curve corresponds to the amount of reagent added, or added over time. You see the regulation of dosing rates so the heat gets to 5 watts in the first step and 10 watts in the second step. The overall heat of reaction was found to be approximately 14 kJ. This was one example of application that real-time heat measurement allows. We have other ideas in mind and we'll certainly work hard to validate them in the months to come. Some of them are, for instance, 1. Automatic determination of reaction starts and end points based on reaction heat. 2. Automatic adjustment of reaction rate through reaction heat. Actually, rate and heat for a given reaction go hand in hand. 3. One shot determination of how much excess reagent is necessary to drive a given reaction to completion. Again, based on detected heat. 4. Optimization of stirring speed for reaction limited by mass transfer by regularly increasing the stirring speed and have an automatic detection of heat plateau so you know the reaction is not under mass transfer regime anymore. 5. A more forward-thinking example is, for instance, catalyst stability study using multiple pulse heat experiments. These are just ideas or concepts at this stage and we need to further work on. The last example is very much about the scale-up of fine chemicals, intermediates and APIs. Scale-up of chemical processes can lead to many problems, including lower than expected yields, poor quality products which need reworking, and, in a worst-case scenario, runaway reactions. 
all are caused by lack of control of key parameters or sometimes a lack of understanding of what parameters need to be controlled. For instance, these are pictures of a small-scale Grignard reaction proceeding from the beginning when the reagents are charged to the round bottom flask up to the moment when magnesium, the catalyst, gets activated and starts reacting. On a small scale, it looks like this, yellowish and mildly bubbly or foamy. But as the scale goes up, you may get something that looks like this, or even actually like this. So the question is, how can we prevent this from happening? The model reaction here is the formation of 4 methyl magnesium bromide. The initial reactor charge includes THF, toluene, and magnesium metal. The temperature is raised to 40 degrees and 4 bromotoluene is added to the vessel. We want to detect the reaction start point. We are particularly interested in having a better insight into the delayed initiation that characterizes Grignard reactions in general. We need to know when the reaction is completed as well as the overall generated heat, the maximum heat output at the maximum rate point, and some of the safety key variables that I will detail later. The power of real-time heat here has to do with detection of reaction start and end points, accurate online heat measurement, as well as reaction enthalpy. As shown on this slide, when you use heat flow as a method, the information you get while running the reaction is mostly qualitative. You do get a good idea when exactly the reaction starts and stops thanks to the TR minus TJ signal and the overlap with the dosing profile, but at this point the maximum heat output is not known, neither is the thermal accumulation value. Now, <coughs> once the reaction is done and the final thermal calibration completed, which is right there, then you get all the data you need for safety evaluation or maybe kinetic modeling. You get the reaction enthalpy, the maximum heat output, thermal accumulation value, delta T adiabatic, heat transfer coefficient, reaction heat capacity, and so on and so forth. When running the same reaction without ECAL, the difference is that you get most of the data while running the reaction without having to wait until the end of the final calibration. You still need to end until you, you still need to wait until the end of the reaction, which happens sooner than the end of the final calibration though, for parameters that require the reaction to be finished, like delta T adiabatic or maximum temperature of the reaction and thermal accumulation as well. I like to come to a final conclusion. and take the opportunity to step back for a second and try to see where the value of RT Carl really is. If you look at the entire project workflow, you have the experiment followed by a data evaluation step with the loop going back to more experiments when needed. Then there is a phase when data is documented for tech transfer and finally scale up. Initially at the experiment phase, a few hours are going to be saved thanks to the absence of calibration and no need for the user to be present during the experiment. The evaluation phase is greatly reduced and it's almost like no ex specific expertise is required. If you work in process safety where data reliability is absolutely critical, then you may be interested in running heat flow and RT call at the same time for results confirmation so you reduce the number of confirmation experiments. Now, on the advanced feedback control front, you can imagine feeding the small vessel with planned vessel constraints as far as heat transfer and mass transfer and optimize the process more rapidly like this and minimize the number of experiments required uh, to get a process that can reasonably run in the plant. You can also expect to cut back on the time it takes to get the value of the data from the lab to the plant by taking advantage of the real-time aspect. As soon as you get it, which is instantaneous, you transfer it. I hope this presentation stimulated your interest and gave you a glimpse at how RTCAL can be used as a PAT from now on. 
I, I thank you for listening and I'd be happy to answer questions you may have.